Today is August 2nd, 2011. My name is Latasha Wilson and I'm with the Oklahoma Oral History Research Program at Oklahoma State University Library. I am in the home of Sue Knight today, visiting with her about her time growing up and some of her stories for O State Stories, the project of the Oklahoma Oral History Research Program. So thank you for talking with me today. Let's start out by having you tell me when and where you were born. All right. I was born in Holmville, Oklahoma, uh, in October the 12th, 1933. Uh, my official name is Norma Sue Burris, so it's on the birth certificate. Uh, I never have gone by Norma because that's my mother's name. My mother's name was uh, uh, Norma Burks. And my father's name was Adrian Burris. And where were you born? In Holdenville. In a home or in the hospital? Uh, at home. At home. Uh, my mother had five daughters, and I think all the first three, I think we were all born at home. I know I was. And then the other two were later on, and they at the hospital. <laughs> so where did you fall in the line of children? Were you the third? I was the middle daughter of five. <laughs> and uh, for many years, I guess five years or so, I was the baby. And, uh, uh, you know, then a couple of interlopers came in and, <laughs> and I wasn't the baby anymore. <laughs> well, how did your parents get to Holdenville? Yeah. Well, they came into Oklahoma. Um, I'm not sure what date it was. I know that my father was born, I think, in a wagon after they had come to Oklahoma and were waiting to get their farm. Um, they came in from Missouri, this, this family of uh, Lena Burris and James Burris were his parents. And there is a, uh, they were all kind of camped out while they were waiting and uh, would hang their, uh, their clothing and such, you know, and, and what they washed and the ladies would drape them around places and that came to be called Ragtown. And there is still Ragtown there, uh, what highway is that off of her? 75. Off 75 few miles out, what, east of Wetumpka? East of Wetumpka. We, east of Wetumpka. Oh, no, I'm, I'm sorry. It's south of South of Wetumpka. Anyway, uh, nobody hardly knows now why that's called Ragtown. Hmm. Do you know how long that lasted? How long they... Well, probably not very long because they were getting into homes and, and uh, buying uh, farms and such. And I think probably a number of his family may have come too. Uh, at the same time, or there was certainly a group there. Uh, and he was born in 1901, and um, so that was, you know, I suspect by 1904 or 5 that all those people were probably in houses. Mm -hmm. But uh, but that's when they came in and were uh, the closest town to them was Wetumpka. And then my mother's group, my grandmother and um, her um, family, and she was, um, I think, a young bride at the time. Anyway, uh, again, it was two or three families came together. Uh, one of the uh, uh, families that came was a uh, widow named Brooks and she had four boys and my grandmother had married one of those boys <coughs> and, uh, then uh, her my grandmother's maiden name was McCray uh, and she married um, one of the Burks boys Andrew Burks and um, later on after they came in um, there were some mar marrying again, you know, and because she was a widow when she married, and so uh, we wound up with a bunch of double cousins and things <laughs> before it all settled out. But they were also in Wetumpka. Now, as far as I know, they were in one part of the county 
and my father's family were in the uh, another part of the county, but my parents met at high school in Wetumpka. Hmm. So, uh, so that's where where they met. Do you know when they got married? Um, Twenty. 1927. You know, Joanne, my oldest sister, my age. was the same age as my husband. So I was born in 28. 28. So she, they must have. Uh, 26 or 27. 27, I think. 1927. Hmm. And um, anyway, uh, when the parents came first came in when this group came in in their covered wagons actually coming up from Texas this is my mother's family they first came into Broken Arrow and that's where my mother was born so she was born actually in uh, and I think it was already a statehood no it wasn't statehood yet because her her uh, she was born in 1905 yeah, so, uh, so it was still uh, Indian Territory then, hmm. two more years before it was Oklahoma. Uh, and she was one of six girls and one boy. Hmm. And uh, they, no. I'm every they only had one boy to carry on the maiden name. Well now, my grandmother had been one of nine McCray girls. So the McCray girls uh, and some of the Burke's boys married, but in both cases, as far as far as we're concerned, um, like the McCray name was lost, got mm -hmm. daughtered out, as they say. And then my grandmother had uh, uh, six girls and one boy, and uh, my uncle Clyde had three girls. <laughs> so again, you know, the, uh, uh, that name when you're doing genealogy searches, you know, suddenly you kind of come to block at times yeah. like that. Wow. But uh, my uh, father, I don't remember much about the Depression because I, I was born in 33 and I can remember things looking back. I can see that people were pretty poor, you know, some of my... Uh, uh, aunts or uncles or cousins, you know, be moving in with the ones that were on the farm and that sort of thing, but I really didn't think about it. And my dad got a job. He had come up to Oklahoma A&M, and I don't know whether he had taken some, uh, whether there was a kind of an academy there at this time, and he was there for a while and had to come back to Wetumpka when times got hard or what, but Anyway, um, he uh, was an engineer, and so he got a job like in WPA and such, helping with the road construction hmm. and uh, uh, different things. That I remember his saying that he would, if they were clearing out for to build roads, and the people be paid, you know what little amount it was, but they'd be paid, but he'd always have them cut up the, uh, uh, any lumber or anything that they had to clear out so that the people could take it home for firewood. Mm. Uh, but that's about, I don't remember very much at all about the Depression. Dad came up here and it was a uh, kind of a high school cadet. I'm not, I'm not sure because uh, the CCC? Uh, no, it was before well, he was actually, see, there was already uh, the college oh, here. And it was somehow associated with the college. Uh -huh. But I don't know, as I say, it's whether it was kind of for something for, for uh, high school boys uh, huh. or whether he actually had a year or two. Anyway, I know he finished, he finished uh, high school, graduated from high school. Hmm. And uh, at yeah. the same year, and yet he is two, about two and a half years older than my mother. So somewhere in there, but I just never did think to try to get it all, all of that straightened out. Also, he came up here as an engineer and paid Main Street of Stillwater. Yes, when I was 
I was in junior high, I think, then. He was a contractor and built roads. And, and he did paved different Main things. Street and Stillwater? And Stillwater, yes. Hmm. Got a picture of that, if you want to see it. Yeah. Um, and he paved an awful lot of the roads. And then, when I'm remembering him, uh, I always remembered him as working for the highway department. And he drove a little orange pickup, and uh, uh, so we built a lot of bridges and, and roads. And then as I got older, he started doing, um, he left the highway department and was a contractor and still uh, built a lot of the bridges and things on our interstates when they first went in. Yeah, mm -hmm. including on the turn to turn. Yeah. Now, I, some of my best memories I remember was when Ada and I was uh, five, four or five, I think, when we moved to Ada. And that's where I went to grade school. Um, when I was in about the second grade, second or third, I can't remember now exactly which it was, uh, I remember um, uh, Pearl Harbor Day. And the Ada Evening News actually came out with an extra. And we heard them going up and down the street. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and a and lot she of worked during the war, you know, she was one of those volunteer <laughs> workers. Yes, um, <laughs> uh, third and fourth grader. I went around with a friend, and did I tell you this earlier? And we were gathering bacon grease because you see all these posters you'd see then you'd see a poster of a lady pouring grease and it wound up pouring down and coming out of a cannon you know as wow. a, because apparently a fat like that could be as an ingredient in manufacturing what would it be gun smoke uh, gun smoke, gun powder. Yeah. Hmm. Um, so I it was a hot day and I had my little wagon and a friend and we went around gathering up bacon grease which splashed all over everything because they got all melty. Oh. And then we were supposed to be able to turn it in at the so grocery well. stores. None of the grocery stores wanted my grease mm. <laughs> because there hadn't been anything set up for them to collect it for somebody. And I finally got somebody out of pity, I think, took the bacon grease. But um, mm. anyway, that was a war effort that didn't mm. quite turn out like I thought it should. Really? But in school, we would sell, um, uh, one day a week, we would sell uh, the, the stamps, like I showed you, that when you got the little book full, it was, uh, had, it was um, what, seven, seventeen dollars and seventy-five cents. Seventeen fifty. to fill up one of those, and then it was a, would mature as a twenty-five dollar bond. Hmm. Uh, but. Um, I still have some of them. So we had, uh, yeah. anyway, that was an interesting thing to do because the, uh, the uh, everybody was involved. <laughs> Too bad you can't get this. <laughs> do you remember your parents doing anything? Uh, well, my it? dad having five daughters and was probably in his 40s by then, so there was never a problem of his, him being drafted. But he did, was involved in a lot of uh, uh, road building and things, like when the road, for uh, what needed to be done to keep uh, Well, we, we still have, but we definitely then had uh, quite a few, uh, well I know it, Altus and Norman and Enid and McAllister and how many places did we have uh, military bases or plants or factories or something up in Oklahoma City there was a uh, Douglas manufacturing I worked Tinkerfield. in Tinkerfield and uh, so uh, there was just a lot that had to be done in this Oklahoma at Oklahoma that time. And I remember we had moved to Ardmore. I went to junior high at Ardmore, finished school and uh, elementary school in, in Ada, and uh, then junior high in Ardmore. And 
I remember sitting out on the swing in the front yard and hearing a lot of honking one afternoon, and it was uh, uh, VE Day, Day Europe. It, oh, was it VE Day or did they, was it uh, no, I think it's, uh, Normandy? No, it, it was VE uh, Day. Uh, it was both, it, it, both of them were celebrated, but it was um, the day that, uh, anyway, victory in Europe. Hmm. And I'm not sure, you know, it was some months after that uh, before Japan surrendered. But, yeah, but and I don't remember where I was then, but I just remember I didn't care. we were out several blocks from downtown or anything, and I heard this honking <laughs> and then realized what it was. But that was before um, television and everything that would be you know, really letting you know. So it sounds like were you kind of a city girl growing up? Did well, you live in town. Sort of. Uh, I lived in town the whole time. I never lived in a big city though, mm -hmm. because by the time I got to high school, we had moved again, and I went to high school in Altus. But the war was over then. Uh, but the house we had in Altus was one that was built. Uh, there was an Air Force base had been there, and uh, they'd go in and build a whole bunch of nice houses, small houses, uh, just two bedroom uh, and such, but they wartime were war, housing. Yeah, wartime housing is what it had been built for. Mm -hmm. But the war was over and um, I graduated from high school, I uh, was a salutatorian of my class. How many were in your class, do you remember? Uh, well, we had a very small class. Uh, we were kind of known for that. For some reason or other, there was just 67 or 69 in our graduating class, but um, there was 300 in the high school and just three mm -hmm. grades, so our class was kind of small. But uh, then my parents moved to Oklahoma City and some time went by and I uh, needed, I didn't want to take practical things when I was in high school, like how to type, <laughs> things like that, mm -hmm. things that I knew I wouldn't be good at. Um, so uh, I'm in Oklahoma City and in order to get a job, I was uh, going to Hills Business University. And uh, this uh, fellow um, had come back from the Marines. And um, I think the typing teacher was trying to uh, do a little matchmaking. But anyway, she had me go up and tell that fellow up there, show him how to set the tab on his typewriter. That's right. But, mm -hmm. but that's your excuse for the first day, but only the second day. Well, <laughs> I just sat down behind him in case he had any more trouble with setting the tab. And what was that fellow's name? That fellow's name was Earl. <laughs> But we then dated for some time. He had to finish his, and I finished and got where I was working as a stenographer. And um, making more money than me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I went to work for the company that wound up after several name changes, the Amico, which has now been taken over by British Petroleum. But anyway, I guess I worked about three years. But but we. We got around to getting you went married. To work for yeah. the old Stanlin Oil Company. Yeah, Stanlin Oil is what it was called then. And, and it became part of the family. And this is kind of a little couple of interesting stories about this. I was, I had a job while I was going to business school. And I delivered, uh, worked for a real estate company. And I would always, I had a job of de delivering various papers, contracts, deeds, that sort of thing, to different places there in o downtown Oklahoma City. My office is in the First National Building. And uh, I was a file clerk and would have, but have to run around all over the downtown uh, delivering these things. Just worked afternoons. But it was kind of important for me to tell time. To get back from some of these. So 
and I had never had a, a wristwatch of any kind. So I went in to B.C. Clark, and they were having their anniversary sale, and I bought a watch. And I think the watch cost $19, and it's a beautiful little bulba. And um, okay. I, yeah, it's a nice little thing. And I would, I just, could, they let me pay it out at $5 a month. Well, I think I got it paid off early, I believe. So then some time went past, past and Earl and I decided to get married and we were gonna buy a house. So we went in to buy a house and we're gonna get it on the GI Bill. And we had trouble getting uh, the, the mortgage because neither one of us had a credit. I mean, you know, we'd, neither one of us had ever borrowed any money. Everything was just cash. And then I remembered my wristwatch. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so that's the way we qualified for, qualified for the loan. <laughs> One of us had a, a credit rating, <laughs> but I thought that was funny. We, uh, you can see, he and I are, um, uh, feel the same way about uh, being in debt. <laughs> but a uh, real nice house. Uh, and it's still, if you drive through that part of uh, War Acres, it was called in Oklahoma City, still a nice house. How long did you live there? Uh, we moved from there in... Four years. Yeah, probably about four or five years. Benita started school. Yeah, Benita started school. We had Amy and we had John, and then Earl got a job with... Um, Department of Agriculture, being an auditor, and we moved to Woodward, and, uh, and for the you first, were there four years. yeah, we were there four years. But he had to uh, uh, travel, and so this was the first time that I'd ever had to spend um, nights without him, you know. And that was something. And we moved into this house, and this was just a few years after that Woodward tornado, mm, which see, for many years, yeah. Uh, well, it had been more than a few years, but anyway, the town no, it was, was still... Uh, the, the tornado was in 48. I think 47. 47, 48, I don't remember, but it's right in there somewhere. Anyway, it? the house it was, that... It's the worst tornado Oklahoma ever had, mm -hmm. The uh, house that we had had been destroyed in the tornado, mm -hmm. and it was rebuilt. Except that when they rebuilt the house, now the family that was there, they had run down into the basement, and so they all survived, but rebuilt the house, but they decided they wanted it a little bigger. So on one side of the house, where the bedrooms were, they just went out, poured another foundation, and built a house out there. Well, somehow or other, some part of that tended to settle. And so here I am, and down that hallway, around the bedrooms, you can just hear somebody walking as the house oh, could goats. settle. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, I was terrified. Mm -hmm. I, got, I slept with a 22 beside me, and I know that's just the sound of this house, but then we got a child dog. And her name was China, and she was a really, really she nice dog. <laughs> but she would prowl up and down that hall, and I knew that all I was hearing was China's <laughs> um, nails, toenails on the hall. But mm -hmm. that was that's the main thing I remember about uh, that whole thing. Was then I could sleep, I could sleep in <laughs> peace, and I knew that dog was going to protect me. <laughs> and. Uh, then we moved to uh, Stillwater in 64. Yeah. And we put one daughter in junior high. You moved to Stillwater. I, I arrived here and then moved, moved yeah. in fact, over to Arkansas. Uh -huh. You remember Billy saw Estes 
I got in on all those investigations that they were having. That, that's a big thing happened back then in mm -hmm. the agriculture. So I just left home. <laughs> but we did very well, and this was, uh, uh, we lived in North Husband, and our summers, Again, he was nice. traveling so much that our summers, we just walked out and traveled with him. <laughs> and we, the kids learned to swim in the motel pools, and uh, we could. Uh, One of us worked, yeah. the others loafed. Well, and sometimes <laughs> I'd take my sewing machine with me. But it was, uh, we had really, really nice summers. And really enjoyed our, uh, the kids, we were, all together as a family all for the whole summer so the traveling and every time Earl could get home on weekends and of course he, he did but it was uh, uh, pretty nice you know the fact he had to travel so much but we were together so much during the summers that mm -hmm. it uh, uh, we well, get three enjoyed it yeah and so Benita, would you drive from place to place yeah, yeah, it's strictly because he, being with the Department of Agriculture, he was almost always going to rural areas, mm -hmm. and so it uh, it was driving. But he drove so many that usually every year he had to buy a car. Mm -hmm. So we had a car for me, and bought it while we were at Woodward, and it was a Plymouth. What was the age of it? It's fairly old then. Fairly old, 50s. But it was, it was a, a, a... You bought a Chrysler, didn't you? And it was a Plymouth, but it was the Chrysler Plymouth dealers where we bought it. Oh, yeah, this Chrysler. You got a Chrysler. No, the gray one was the Plymouth. The white and red one was the Chrysler that Benita liked to drive. Yeah, but that was later. <laughs> anyway, this is an old car. And John, our son John at this time, was Quite about... Five or six. He was ashamed of that car, and as we'd be driving down Duck Street, he'd like to roll down the window and say, "My dad drives a Ford, whatever it was, you know, 500. <laughs> Ford 500." But this is always a you know up-to-date car, and it, <laughs> it really bothered John that he had to drive ride in the bad one. But you never got out of town with it, for goodness' sake. But suffering. I got tired <laughs> of being. And at the only adult alone Lord, for most of the time. And um, so I decided to go to college. And I Three enrolled in uh, the, One of them in the high school. <laughs> home economics. And wasn't really sure I could, you know, real trepidation about coming back to school because I was an older woman by that time and all those young oh, kids yeah, I and I thought how can I hold my own with all these kids and um, so I only enrolled in 10 hours my first semester and I made two A's and a B and I thought man that, that's good. Yeah what was the B for? I think that's the only B you ever made. That's the only B I ever made. <laughs> <laughs> Probably their own. <laughs> the rest of it. Well, there was a humanities teacher I didn't get along with once. Is that when you <laughs> took a uh, bow and arrow or something? Yeah, that's right. Mm. Archery. Didn't do well. mm. I didn't do get well. I had to buy a bow and arrow. Before this, had, did you get an associate's degree from the business college or did you just take no, classes? There? What I did is I just took classes until uh, I got a job. Mm -hmm. You know, I just went in and tested for the job and was able to do it. But I knew that business was not the field for me to go in. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I could outtype her for crying out loud. <laughs> but she had a good business. Yeah, I did. Uh, but I knew that I wasn't good at things like typing. And, and I could learn the shorthand fine, you but getting, shorthand. getting building up speed. And I, I guess I, I did all right, and I, yes, you did. we, uh, uh, I'm not sure where I was going with that. Oh, yeah, you know, I hadn't, that was my first, and I 
kept going until I got three degrees. Yeah, she had no credit <laughs> hours called for the college. Yeah. And she had three kids. Yeah. One of them was in high school. But anyway, when I started, I think she was still in junior high. In too, she was still in junior high. So what started. year did you enroll at OSU? I think it was 65. 1965. I think then I graduated. And I figured it would take me a long time to graduate. And then I graduated in uh, 69. With yeah, a degree in, in home, economics home economics education. And did get the teacher certificate along with it. And then you I decided. Yeah, you did teach, didn't you, for a while at high school? At, uh, no, just substitute. I did a lot of substitute teaching for a yeah, year that after that. Then I decided to go and get my master's. And, um, did that, did research in uh, dairy, science. dairy science, my master's degree, got a food science degree in the dairy science department. Uh, Dr. Jim Mickle was my advisor in that. Real nice uh -huh. What year did you start your master's? How soon after your bachelor's? 70, I guess, was it soon? It wasn't long. She just yeah. turned right around on that. Uh -huh. Mm -hmm. well, and then uh, I went on into uh, and got involved in food product development during my master's uh, and uh, then went on to get my uh, PhD and was working with, uh, I did interesting things with yeast in my master's degree. Mm -hmm. And we wound up um, finding it. In the it, master's. In the master's. Yeast? Yeah. And we uh, were trying to grow yeast on cheese whey. On cheese whey? Yeah. Hmm. Because it was a real waste product then. Hmm. And uh, we met a fellow at one of the dairy meetings, and he was then the uh, owner of the Watonga cheese plant. And he was having a terrible time getting rid of his way hmm. when he'd make cheese. And because um, only mammals can eat uh, uh, milk sugar, and so he couldn't feed the whey to chickens, it would kill him. Uh, you, uh, uh, dogs, pigs, pigs could handle whey, but even cows, you couldn't feed them very much of the, of the sugar. And I'm not sure why cows couldn't, but nonetheless, uh, there was a real problem of how to get rid of that cheese whey. And one, uh, so he had been spraying it on fields as fertilizer. One day, one of the people who was supposed to carry the cheese way off just decided to quit early, and he went in and dumped it in the uh, North Canadian River and <laughs> killed fish all the way to Oklahoma City. Oh <laughs> so he was afraid he would be subject to you know, a real lawsuit, except I don't think they ever figured out who had <laughs> dumped it. But uh, it, it was a problem, so we were having to try to find a, a uh, uh, yeast for it. And so this is what Dr. Mickle was doing. And, um, but we uh, did find out uh, most yeasts don't like uh, uh, milk lactose either. That's not, so I wrote to the uh, uh, American Type Culture Collection, which all of that is, is organisms. You know, if you're wanting to do some research or something with an organism, they have these mm -hmm. so that you can get them. And there was only one kind of yeast that they had there that was both recognized as a human food source because that was going to be pretty important to us, and could ferment uh, lactose. 
So we had that. Now this is some years go by, but there's a little interesting thing about that. After I got my, uh, uh, I started to uh, back, got my uh, uh, degree, and uh, some years we went to St. Louis, came back, I got uh, a job at, at Oklahoma State University teaching my favorite classes, and I was just thrilled and was involved in research. What you, you forget to say, you, in the interim, you did get your PhD, and while we were in St. Louis, they did hire you to teach. Oh yeah, and I taught at the Christian Academy in Greater St. Louis. Yeah, taught after school. you had your PhD? Yeah. And what was your well, PhD in? Uh, it was also in food science. And what did you teach? But I got it in the School of Home Economics. Mm -hmm. uh, but I, oh, I taught everything. They decided there at the Christian Academy in Greater St. Louis, and this is a, a, a private religious school, and they kid, bus kids got bussed in from all over. And they thought if, I, if nobody associated with the school had a PhD, <laughs> and I had finished it. <laughs> and got mine, and so they assumed I could teach anything. So I did. Mm -hmm. yeah. I did teach a home economics class. I taught math to eighth grade, eight, seventh and eighth graders, and I taught science to seventh and eighth graders, and biology to juniors, and something else to seniors. But uh, was the, that all at the same time? All at the same time. Oh my goodness. <laughs> That was kind of funny, you know, well, if you got that, you can teach anything. Wow. <laughs> I didn't teach religion, but... Uh, but. Uh, and had you gone on straight from your master's to start on your PhD? Yes, I did. Do you remember what year you finished your PhD? <sighs> yeah. Uh, 70s. 70, 73, I believe, when you got your diploma. Yeah. For her master's? Because we moved to St. Louis. And that was something I was going to check for you yeah. before you came back and forgot <laughs> to get those actual I believe things. I moved to St. Louis in 70. I moved before you did because I had to be up there and get a house. So I believe you came up after school was out. And But I had to finish. I had to finish writing my thesis yeah, and dissertation and then go back for my orals. Something like that. Yeah. But anyway. What was your dissertation on? Um... Dr. Winterfeld um, had gotten a large grant from the Department of Agriculture to try to establish um, a relationship with dietary chromium and diabetes. And so that was what I worked on. Um, put in a lot of time. Um, we just never really could document a strong relationship there. And you got your di dietetics, uh, as, what do you call it, when you become a registered dietitian? Yeah. Time. Yeah. So I you were prefer, I would, became a registered dietitian too. Degree was in food but the uh, um, we really got a better relationship. What we're doing, we're analyzing hair. Some researcher had determined that hair could wind up, I mean, dietary chromium could wind up in hair, you know, and so then we tried to establish whether or not there was a relationship between the amount of hair, you know, what was in the hair and uh, the others, but that chromium was so hard to analyze for in such small amounts. Now, about a year or two after I was through, they came out with equipment that could really measure in parts per billion, and that's really what you needed to, for the chromium. So we just looked at several other minerals too, and I got a pretty good uh, relationship between zinc and, and the hair and the diet, uh, because we were collecting food and everything, 
had the students keep track of what they were eating, which is pretty easy when we had all these kids that were eating in the dorms. Mm -hmm. uh, but what, what we started out to do, um, we weren't able to do. But I was doing this work for her uh, as part of that. And uh, got to do some teaching. And so I had experience in teaching. Didn't. Anyway, I was going to go back now. See, I'm back now. I've gone to work for the university. Um, I got my lab over in the old building and we're doing things. And I was a member of the uh, uh, Food Technologists, IFT, uh, in, 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 uh, International Food Technologists. I've kind of forgotten what the IFT is. Yeah, we could be is. off of But we, we, uh, I had, uh, we were touring different food things here in town, I mean in the state. And uh, Phil's Petroleum was trying to get into some food manufacturing. And they had set off another spin-off company called Provesta, which was doing their uh, food, and so they had those Provesta uh, people have become uh, members of the uh, IFT. And uh, I was a president of that year of the IFT section, and we set up a tour of the Bartlesville uh, uh, plant where they were had worked out a way to actually um, grow yeast starting with petroleum and it was an interesting thing to do but it's all hydrocarbons no matter which way you're going and so they had worked out a, a way to uh, develop this this yeast that they were growing anyway we went a tour of their lab and I went in to where they were uh, growing and experimenting with different kinds of yeast, and I said, "You're right. You're growing Cluvermyces in cheese way, you know." And it, well, you could tell by the smell, and also I had seen a box over here that had dry yeast and uh, some growing? dry way. Yeah, they were, had driveway they were using, and they were doing this, and uh, the fellow looked kind of funny. And he said, you're not a, a what, do you, what do you call, kind of a spy? They're kind of chemist, though. No, did, you know, he was, that was supposed to be a real secret, what they were doing, <laughs> and I told him. So anyway, uh, no, but it, I mean, I'd worked with that so in my master's, and mm -hmm. so of course, I, I knew that was the only yeast they could be using, because that was the only one that was rated for, for uh, human consumption, and I'd seen these big th things full of dried whey, and so anyway, I kind of impressed them, and so um, I got a grant from them to develop food uses for this this yeast that they were mm. doing. And at that time, it seems like my first grant I got with them was, I think, for $100,000. And the, the dean and the department head were just, that was the biggest, at that time, mm. the biggest grant that they ever received. So, um, who was the dean and department head at that time? The dean uh, was, um, hmm. oh, names don't come to me. Department head was uh, Esther Winterfeld. Hmm. And uh, the. Uh, was the other gal's name? It wasn't Barbara, though. It was, who was it? No, but. Did she went on one too? The. Uh, actually, she was the dean that was dean. Well, I'll have to, to you can look it up. I, yeah, I'll look it up. <laughs> you can look it up. I know her very well. There's just been one other dean after her. Now, since I have retired, uh, 
there's now uh, another dean over there now, but it, it uh, anyway. The two deans. Yeah. yeah. Yes, but that yeah. was that was kind of a funny thing that hmm. uh, because that really <laughs> that really uh, m m set me up. You know, in other words, I was. Hmm. Uh, very. You gave her all, all the time yeah, it, it, it got me. A, a, yeah, and they wound up the, the uh, dean uh, fixed. I was over in the old home, like in the East Building, and it just really was not a very good. Well, it was kind of <clears throat> falling down, um, and so anyway, developed a, one of the basement labs, a really large lab that I could teach both my experimental foods class in and continue. Mm -hmm. of whatever research I was doing. Tell me about the yeast. That was a great yeast. Well, it was... Um, Pure? It was... This, we put it in a meal on the go bar, took it to different things. Uh, we had a... Uh, another thing that we, it worked in really well was something we called potato puffs. And we'd take instant potato. And, you know, there's very little protein in potatoes. The kids love potatoes, particularly fried. So um, some of my graduate students, we worked together and they made such something that was called potato puffs. And we put the yeast in it, and this is a, a nice mild flavored yeast, so it wasn't real strong. And I put it and uh, started with instant potatoes and had that in there and so you had a really, it, it really improved the food value of what would be like a, a French fry. And we made it in little, uh, uh, what you do is use the inside of the donut cutter, you know, we took the little center thing that cut that out. So she'd make those and we'd fry them and she was, uh, they were, that uh, was one thing that the, Phillips Provesta people liked uh, real well, and they were going to take it to one of their food shows. And so I had Carla, and she was making these, and she'd take one and she'd slap her hand and knock it out of the little thing, and there was no way they were going to, they want thousands of those things to take the food show. So the um, Phillips people bought us a, a cookie cutter. You know, so you filled this vat with the stuff and it extruded it through and we worked with with um, Bama to make a, something, <laughs> Bama pies, hmm. uh, so that they could be extruded and put out there. And so we were making some of these. We, we got the cookie cutter, filled the vat. Uh, they had to... Uh, mix up a big batch of it and we put it in there and it mixed it up and it extruded it and one very very hot day we started to decide we better fry them because see we'd gone from little batches of 100 grams of potato up to these huge amounts and so we took it in the lab and uh, there was a salesman or somebody coming in and wanting to talk to me and <laughs> And one of those students came out, and her eyes were just like that. And she says, Dr. Knight, they're exploding. <laughs> and so I went in, and they were exploding. They were flying all over that old, old <laughs> building. And apparently I didn't know that there was any gluten in potatoes, but it was developing something in that extra mixing that was developing a toughness. They added quite a bit of protein to those little things. Well, yeah, but there's no gluten in protein either, any whatever it was. Uh, and they were fl each one of them was flying into three pieces, oh a top gosh. and a bottom and this still soggy middle. Uh -huh. And they were just going all over the lab. <laughs> and, <I laughs> and all we could really do was just let them all pop. Uh -huh. But there wasn't any lid or anything. And so... I crawled over under a table and reached up and got some aluminum foil and made myself a shield and I went right <laughs> put it over the top. The students were really impressed. <laughs> and then all we could do is just, you know, uh, 
just let them all pop, but at least they were contained. But I'll bet when we moved out of that lab, if you'd looked close enough, somewhere in there, you'd still found pieces of potato puffs. <laughs> but we got them, and uh, they were delicious. But all we had to do was we had to make up these hundred gram measure up the hundred gram batches give them just the amount of mixing, put that one little thing in there and extrude it. And so we had to have an assembly line. And they'd start off with just these small amounts and put them in there and the mixing and then go through it. Because that was the only way we figured how to do it in such short notice. Mm -hmm. Tell them what you didn't do. Well, we, uh, yeah, for this meeting, what they were wanting to do was have a, a uh, uh, They wanted to set up in a, a fancy hotel suite and invite all the people that were coming to this uh, IFT convention that was starting. And they'd invite people and they wanted to have uh, serve these potato puffs as something that they were doing. And of course we couldn't have them flying all over. But they did tell us later that apparently one batch that we had already mixed up must have gotten in accidentally, and so they did have one that, that I warned them, you know. But you took those to Atlanta. And yeah, we they took them to very, well very well received. And the idea was to sell them to old folks' home because they would up the protein content. And, and, to, uh, hmm. and to, as well as school children. How would you package them? Like uh, they would just be packaged and uh, my thought was fried on site. Oh. You know, like, like frozen french fries and things. Mm -hmm. hmm. But uh, anyway, uh, ProVista sold off a part of that and... Uh, yeah, they sold that process. That and uh, then I'd also done a meal on the go bar, which, which was going very fun. well. Well, the company that, that bought that off called me and they wanted me to make all kinds of nutritional claims, you know, I guess for, for mm. because at these health food stores or something. Well, no, I, I improved the protein content, I made it a better food, but it wasn't anything magic. And so I don't know where it went from there. I wouldn't do Remember we went to Creed and that guy that was selling up there and Creed at the store there? He said that, that was the only one of these kind of breakfast bars, you know, that he liked. Is that meal on the go? Yeah. He kind of flattered you there. Yeah. <laughs> he didn't even know you. you know, so. so about making the other product you made so well was biscuits. But you, come on, mom. You go biscuits. To, you go to <laughs> old rabbit ears down there and eat biscuits. Those are your biscuits. Oh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, what's he would work with? I'd work with uh, Bama Pies, and the lady there at Bama Pies who did any new product development. That this is this is our Tulsa Bama Pies. Anyway, um, I got a telephone call one day, and they came in and said the phone says Bonita Watts. Yeah, she says Bonita she's told Bama. us uh, says we want to start making biscuits. See, they were doing a lot of work with McDonald's, and they wanted to start making biscuits for McDonald's. And I said, well, I can give you my biscuit recipe, but I see two things wrong with it. I'm used to making up in small batches, and you know, to make it in a big batch, uh, you'll have to do a lot of experimenting and working with it. But, but I said, I'll give you my recipe and I'll tell you what it is. And it's just a standard recipe for biscuits. But I said, first off, let me tell you, if I don't have buttermilk, I don't make biscuits. And then I just gave the standard thing. But I did get my recipe is two teaspoons of baking powder, quarter teaspoon of soda, cup of buttermilk, two cups of flour, um, and some shortening to cut in. So anyway, that's it. And, and, and but that's a pretty standard recipe. Anyway, but I told them again. I don't know if you. I don't. I know you can buy dry buttermilk, but I've not had much luck with it. Uh, but I just didn't see. Hadn't gone through operation. I just didn't see how they could adapt my recipe to what they were wanting to do. 
Well, about six months later, again, the IFT was taking a tour, and we were going through Bama Pines, and I walked in there, and here was a silo, it looked like, that was two or three stories high, full of buttermilk, <laughs> cold, chilled buttermilk. <laughs> so they did it. And I haven't heard any more whether they're still making those, but my grandson uh, uh, still says that uh, he loves their biscuits. And at McDonald's? Yeah, at McDonald's. <laughs> yeah, but he was, felt real smug when he was talking about they were good, and I told him, well, I gave him the recipe. <laughs> I have no idea what changes they had to make, but they did I taste like mine. Like and you. all the other places I go that have biscuits now, I can taste the baking powder in it. You know, they use too much. They want to try to make them light, or maybe it's I'm tasting the soda. I don't know, whatever it is, there's a, something in there that to me interferes with the flavor. Mm. And, uh, but, not, but, not, but, uh, but uh, according to grandson, and I've never gone in and gotten McDonald's breakfast biscuits, I guess I need to, but he keeps saying. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, that, uh, it's they, kind they, of are, uh, they are still your recipe, but uh, you, know, you like to downplay what you do. But <laughs> these days, they, they sell things like that, but those days you gave it away. You're, well, they, but it was just a standard recipe. There wasn't that anything precious about it. Your recipe, it's, just uh, it's just that they took my word for it that it wouldn't be the same if it didn't standard have recipe. the real. <laughs> so over time doing all this work, have you really developed your taste buds? Um, <laughs> I guess one, that was also another thing that we'd always do anytime you have any kind of a ex foods classes or particularly an experimental or anything. You do try to do some sensory evaluation and develop the techniques for sensory evaluation. Um, but you didn't have classes on it. I never did feel like I was. Mom, quit being so dang modest. I've gone to those classes. <laughs> I was recruited and you'd have big classes on it. People, well, yeah, you know, but... And people but, enjoyed uh, it. Uh, and you also didn't mention the fact that it was you and your students that really helped that guy with head country over there. He came to, uh, over here too, and I wish you would claim some credit for that. After all, I helped taste he it. Helped <laughs> it. <laughs> What's your head country story? Yeah, well, see, this again, I'm not sure, because this is actually for a company that you, I could name. And anyway, uh, uh, Danny Head, the owner of uh, okay. Head Country, and he has this barbecue sauce. You know, and it is good barbecue sauce. Well, there was a certain brand of ketchup he used. And they were going to double almost the price of the ketchup. And that's the basic money, ingredient. Oh, no, I don't know what I should. <laughs> no, it was not. Hunts. It was Hunt's. Okay. <laughs> Somebody got a fur, you But the Hunt's ketchup. Uh, but honey, that's never. <laughs> Mom, we're not claiming anything. We no, I'm just saying uh, we can take it out if you want. <laughs> yeah, because this is a uh, sensitive. I mean, you know. Yeah. I, mean, the, no, I had to sign things that yeah. I wouldn't give away. What was in his? And as a matter of fact, that was the only brand he gave us. In other words, he he didn't even tell us what was in the rest of his mm -hmm. his ingredients. And uh, so, anyway, uh, he had to develop a substitute for Hunt's ketchup because um, he just didn't want to have to pay that much. And he had tried all the other ketchup brands, and his customers could tell the difference. They'd pick up the phone and say, what have you done to your ketchup? So, and all we were wanting was the flavor, you know, not the texture. We, we, he just wanted the flavor. So, I uh, had one of my graduate students at that time lived in Ponca City. And so she set up the, this, uh, uh, t trained her panelists, uh, 
and they're trying to get every, all the ingredients. And then, you know, what's, what's on the a label will tell you what's in there, but not the amount and all of that. So she had to work and with the ingredients that were there and come up with a substitute for she will claim that ketchup. That this was a young lady inexperienced under being tutored by well that's, that's, that's beside, your job you that's your job know. as the director of a graduate student uh, anyway uh, she put them together I don't think though I would have been sensitive enough to pick up this but she had trained all of her panelists and sure enough got a ketchup that uh, they could the, the taste was there so then he came up with his secret other secret ingredients and uh, put it together with the brand name product and with theirs, and they couldn't tell the difference. So mm -hmm. he went back to him and said, "Sorry, you don't need. To, <laughs> I don't need your ketchup anymore." Wow! And suddenly, they decided they could sell that ketchup to him at the price that that had been, <laughs> uh, which was probably better than what it cost him to try to put it together himself. So somewhere he's got that <laughs> recipe down. <laughs> <laughs> If the ketchup people give him any more problems, but he um, he did then when this girl graduated, he hired her to help to develop some of his others like a barbecue. I mean, mm -hmm. a smoke. Anyway, he's got two or three different flavors now mm -hmm. that they have. But. So for something like that, is that just a part of the land grant mission to help other people? That's kind of the way I viewed it. Uh, a lot of people yes, charge a lot. People a lot. Well. He would have paid me something, but I, as an individual, I thought, no, that's that's part of your, you know, that's the four things of, a, of, uh, of one of them. some lady out west, you, you did that. Uh, yeah, I've done, I've done an awful lot of things lot like of, that. You know, Okie mm -hmm. girls, or Okie ladies are yeah. trying to get into and two or three different, uh, but but they're just uh, uh, would work with them and and because uh, if you if if you go from a small amount to a large amount, it's not. It, it, one lady that she was trying to start and did what did start selling her cookies. I don't know how well it did, but her grandmother made the very very best cookies. So she came up and we presented her problem to my, my experimental foods class. She said, I have seen my grandmother make her cookies. I try to copy them exactly. She'll write out a recipe for me and I try to copy it and I simply never can. And so we had some students take on this as a challenge to try to just start with the basic recipe as grandma gave it. And she said, but let me tell you the problem that I have. She said, one day, I said, Mom, I'm going to follow everything you say. And each thing, as you measure it out, I'm going to carefully weigh and try to get exactly how much it was. Uh, like she'd use a teacup instead of a, a regular cup. And so she'd be trying then to put that into a regular cup. So if she has something other than stealing her, her mother's grandmother's teacup. Um, so she's doing it all and she's trying to do it other and, and uh, she said, now the salt. And so she put the salt in there and she tried to figure out exactly how much salt that was in there. So mom helped her figure out how much salt was there that she put in there. So then mom went over here, took a pinch of salt, <laughs> dumped the rest in the sink. Uh. <laughs> so she said, you know, we realized, yes, any of her Recipes are going to be hard to follow, but she, they did work with uh, uh, with them, and uh, uh, she tried to describe what it was and the recipe as best, and uh, uh, they just used you know the techniques that that we had, they had learned in this class. There wasn't anything magic about it, but still, they uh, put that together, and uh, uh, and other people had their, their pickles were. Um, yeah, that's right. That pickle. We're all spoiling because mm. they get yeast in them. And uh, I found out. I said, "Well, if you're not heating it enough." Finn says, "We don't heat them at all." 
And I said, we don't even have a stove. <laughs> and I said, well, then you're just going to be out of business. <laughs> mm. Because you do have to, you obviously had got some yeast contamination. They thought they had so much vinegar in mm. the pickles. Uh, but uh, yeast can tolerate an awful lot of And so they had to get kind of pasteurize it. In other words, they didn't want it. But it was just little things like that, and uh, then one of my graduate students worked with it to try to determine exactly how much heat they'd have to have, you know, to take it and then culture to see if she caught them all. But um, um, we did things like that. Uh, but I really enjoyed doing that, and people got to where they'd call from all over. Hmm. And I think that uh, then the Puanui put in the... Uh, like how your students enjoy it on work in actually. Yeah, oh, we, I mean, we kind of got in trouble once, too, or close. Um, caffeine is extremely bitter. And so caffeine is when we're, when we are doing sensory evaluation, you know, there's sour, bitter, sweet, salty. So you have a control for each of those, what was going to be your sour, bitter, sweet, salty. Um, well, we would usually use sucrose for our sweet because that's the that's the com most common sugar that we use. Um, and we had these different things that we used for each of these and what we used, and this is standard throughout the industry for uh, uh, caffeine is bitter, and uh, you just use tiny amounts of it to, to, to uh, make your standards. Um, do you remember where I'm going with this now? Uh, oh yes, okay. So anyway, uh, the kids got to thinking, they knew that their, a lot of their friends, all they did was have a cup of coffee before they came to class. So they thought, well, they'd do better, you know, if they had something that had at least some food value in it besides just the coffee. So they said, could we put caffeine in a muffin? And I thought, that's innovative. Yeah, try it. Go for it. See how much, you know, you can't put in very much or it's going to start tasting bitter. So they set it up and they did their experiment and they got a like a muffin recipe that they tried and everybody liked it and then they started trying to see how much caffeine they could get in with it and what they were aiming for would be the equivalent of caffeine that you'd get in a cup of coffee. And, uh, and sure enough, they can make it and uh, get it sweet and it, it worked. <laughs> well, but then somebody picked up on what we were doing, came in and interviewed us. And it got on the, I think, at Tulsa picked it up. So it went in the newspaper and on the radio. And oh, then did we start getting complaints. Mm. You know, well, it was better for them than a cup of coffee. You know, but oh, you're trying to put caffeine in all this. <laughs> anyway, so some things, you know, uh, do not. Uh, rebound to your glory like other things do. But I thought the kids did a good job. Yeah. And I thought it was a good idea. Mm -hmm. And then uh, later, uh, you know, they started putting, well, they may have already started putting it in Cokes and, and uh, different soft drinks. Mm -hmm. Well, what are some classes that you taught? I taught um, just what we call science of food prep. And that was a class where, and I loved that class as, as an undergraduate. I loved that class because it tells you what happens when, like, why does the broccoli turn strange color when you cook it? And uh, any of the green vegetables and what you can do to keep that from happening. Um, and uh, the effect of different flowers. Uh, like the bread flour and cake flour and 
and uh, all-purpose flour and how what happens if you bake uh, like a biscuit out of those three or what if you try to make a cake out of those three. Mm -hmm. uh, and in class you could have enough people there that you could assign different ones and then you evaluate them and, and you see it and you just learn what happens in in food and uh, uh, why some starches don't freeze. If you make a pudding out of certain starches and you take it out uh, and if you've frozen it like for a dessert or something that you want to, uh, some of them just are awful. You know, all they do is run water and if you put uh, used regular cornstarch or flour to thicken a pie, if you've made an apple pie and you've used the right, and and you decide to freeze it, save it for Thanksgiving, uh, it'll just be soggy and wet when you get it out. And that's because you have a starch that separates when it freezes. And the water comes out. But not all starches do that. Tapioca doesn't. Uh, waxy potato starch. Anyways, but the, those are the kind of things that, particularly if you're going into a restaurant or anything where you might be wanting to freeze something, that's something you really need to know. And um, there too would have people like from Bama, I've really had a good relationship with them, come over and talk to us and tell us how they, their suppliers for the certain kinds of starches for whatever it was they were wanting to do. and. Um, those are just, I just love that class and I love to teach it because it was, it was so practical and mm -hmm. what you could do. And you. Sounds fun. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. She, she got, she would have like a change coffee people come in mm -hmm. at, at part of the class, you know, and give lectures <laughs> down yeah, how, coffee. And mm -hmm. they love to do it because they knew some of these people were going to be going into restaurants and they sure would like to. But it, it, it was just practical knowledge that, uh, and things that you knew but didn't know. And one of my best, greatest things, I think, impact I had. See, by the time I got through all this and started teaching, I was already at about the age of when I started wanting to do something. And um, I'd see these, these women coming in who would be in their mid-40s, maybe, and divorced, and suddenly they were out, and they just, you know, their, their um, self-esteem was not very high, and they really didn't think uh, they could hack it. Well, I knew very well they could because you got so many life situations and things that when you come into school, you're way ahead of those freshmen as far as knowing what decisions to make and some of that. So anyway, uh, but they'd come in and sometimes they would really be low and they would love that kind of class, you know, knowing there's some of this. And then two, uh, I'd love to talk with them and, you know, let them know that uh, I came in as a latter student and did fine. Can we talk about that a little more? Whenever you started school, your first semester went well, yeah. but what about your first day on campus? Well, What were you feeling? Um, strange, out of place, excited. How old were you? Uh, in your early 30s? No, late 30s. Late 30s? Yeah. I would say so. Uh, give me a year and I'll, I'll do the math. I think it was, you know, I think I started at 65. You, you and, you know, then and, and it wasn't a matter of going on and getting an advanced degree so I could do something. I was just starting from scratch. Mm -hmm. But still had She's time about 33 for a... Years old, I think. For a uh, I think you're about and I could have... I retired at 65 just because I wanted to. Uh, Earl had already, and you could retire at 65, uh, but Earl had already started uh, having some health problems and I just wanted to, you know, we could travel and do things. Uh, I had taught 
I really probably should have taught 18, I mean two more years, because if, if when you're, I don't think you can do that anymore, but when your age and your years taught come out to 80 or something like that, you could, rule of 80. You could get Just full retirement. Rule of 80. And I lacked two yeah. years, but. Uh, well, how was it being a young mother with your husband gone some traveling and going to school? How well, did you balance all of this? Probably to, if anything, it hurt the children. Uh, because I know that there would be times that I was in the house. I tried to schedule my classes so that I would be home, particularly while they were little. But I was home in body. I would be writing a paper, I'd be uh, studying for something. I was there in the house. I wasn't in class, but I was there and, um, and, his, and Earl was gone. So I'm afraid that the fact that I was just there in body but maybe not getting enough involved. None of them ever acted like they felt like that they didn't get enough of my attention. Fortunately, we had an older daughter, and then we had a middle daughter, which was three, four, five years younger, mm -hmm. and then we had the boy, the little boy, so they supervised. You see, mm -hmm. after a while, I'm sure they did. The older yeah. girls helped out. Yeah. and. Uh, and we didn't, we still shared, shared the work, uh, I'd always had, I, at home, you know, we always shared the work, we didn't expect mom to do it all. Uh, but I, a lot of times I do a lot of work after they were asleep, but that looking back, that's kind of one thing that bothers me, and particularly, you know, they say oftentimes the middle child is the one that kind of gets left out, and I kind of think my middle child could have used a little bit more of my attention. <laughs> she doesn't complain about it now, but <laughs> things like that. Uh, but that was it's all. It's your yay, Benita matured you, do I? Uh, yeah, it's well, the older the child, you know, she just, took over. So were things. you in college at the same time as some of your children when you were working on your advanced degrees? Uh, yes, as a matter of fact, uh, David, our our fall crop, our late child, the one that uh, uh, I was getting pretty close to 40 when he was born, so he was much younger than and the you others. And I was uh, working on the, on the PhD. That was interesting too. But Benita was. And, uh, and well, and Amy. Amy was the one that just uh, raised David pretty much. Because Benita, Benita was one, got uh, married. The one I remember that was. Um, felt she was competitive with her mother. Because she was in college. And making not as good a grade as her mother. And, this, <laughs> this, and we had to have a little lecture about that. But that was good that. That was another thing that, uh, that she the kids right didn't out. need to feel like I was in competition with them. Well, what is some advice you have to older students that are just starting out? You mentioned you've had some women that come back yeah. and they're ready to yeah. and start I've had, again. You know, several would come back later and tell me that, that it had been Thank a real. Maryland, Sue. Uh, yeah, and most of these women were women who had been in a divorce and maybe the husband had gone on and gotten a degree and probably they had put him through for a degree uh, but they just you know they were intelligent women and they knew they were but they just thought oh I'm so far behind I just uh, and, and usually I just tell them about me that I started back and look, and I got three, and, and they all thought of me as one of being their best teachers anyway. And um, so that was just great encouragement to them. Uh, because of, you, you of got... How about Marilyn, honey? She, 
Uh, everything you're talking about, look where she's working. Oh, yeah, I think she may be department chair down in Edmond now. But they, that was really all they needed, is just saying, hey, you're, you're better off than these kids are. They may know more about computers, they may, know, they, they may have had higher math than you've had, they may have had all this, but you've got so much more maturity. And, uh, uh, and you're not worried a whole lot about if the fellow sitting behind you is real cute and uh, things like that. Uh, so you can just really devote yourself to learning and get in an area that you like. And, uh, uh, and I don't know of a single returning student that, uh, that didn't do well. How many students do you think you've taught? I don't know. Do you know how many you've advised in graduate degrees? Probably 20, 25, and uh, some of them were international students, uh, some not. But I was, I was blessed with having really good students, uh, you know, really good. and uh, so they did well, and they could do these things on their own. You know, like I. Uh, like the girls that d developed the procedure for really trying to help people with the testing. I, I didn't have time to do all that. Um, but they're good, and if you're working for a degree, um, it really needs to be, they need to have the responsibility and do it. You know, you're there if they're completely doing it wrong or getting off or whatever, but I always had good, such good graduate students. and. Um, you can get a, a, graduate, a research assistantship or a teaching assistantship. And when you're applying for jobs sometimes, the teaching assistantship is one that's, you know, really viewed better uh, for a lot of the jobs you're applying for. Um, I'm not sure why. Uh, but I would see to it that all, whether they were on a like your teaching assistantships were usually through the department and pay for the college. My research assistantships, I usually had enough research money coming in that I paid for them a lot myself, which was one reason why uh, if a lot of these researchers, if they're struggling along with just one assistant uh, that's paid for them, um, you can't get as much done, but if you've got good ones, but you're spending an awful lot of time in guiding those people because then that is your chore. You are guiding them, and they're supposed to be learning how to do all this, and they need to be accepting responsibility too. So, uh, but I've had really good ones. Uh, Lou, this what's her name? Is uh, is she a dean now? She's something. She, she's a University dean or Kentucky. vice president or something of the school in Indiana now. And Maryland is one. But she's uh, got these people strategically <laughs> placed all over, you know, and, and really fine for this. And you still hear from former students? Uh-huh. I'm going I'm to show you something from a former student that I all, I've totally forgotten about this girl. Not completely, because she had every once in a while call me or say something. Yeah, there's some of them that's but, really doing well. She came up for last year, and she was representing, I guess, her 25th year or something. I don't know what, but she called. And they called me and said that this girl said that she wouldn't come uh, if I was going to be there for their, you know, every, all, every fall when you're having homecoming and you try to bring back the students and such. Uh, so here she is. She said she wouldn't come if you... If I weren't there. Oh, if you weren't there. <laughs> oh, wow. Well, is that but, the one that wanted to introduce her? Well, this is the... Uh, well, she wanted me to meet her whole family. <laughs> but she's uh, done great things. I just couldn't even realize, oh, she's got her own company down there doing something, and she's got... She was uh, 
chief dietitian for the Oklahoma City Schools for a while, and anyway, she's just done great she things, and she gave me a ride home proud. in her. And they're proud of these, her, too, because when I talked to them, but she was, I think she was, there was another one too, but she was the first black student, I think, that we'd had hmm. in our college. No, I feel sure in our major anyway. There just weren't very many? Mm -mm. No, this was kind of early on. Hmm. And uh, she was, uh, she just thought I was the greatest and I didn't realize I'd done anything extra special for that well, child. She just. Where does she, where is she in relation to uh, the girl in Memphis that uh, might I know me and her names? She's got their family. You know, Love Day's wife. Oh no, she's in Tulsa. Huh? No. Oh, I say, that's right. She is over there. In what position is she in relation? In in uh, who you trained? You're saying she was the first. I was thought this other girl might. Have been. No, no. Tara came Tara. after. This girl, and Tara, came in to me as a graduate student. Okay. Anyway, to start with, and her husband is from Nigeria, and that was interesting having to um, as my graduate assistant. Tara, brilliant, brilliant girl. Mm -hmm. Her mother was a teacher. Yeah, she's. Yeah, I've had some. And they're doing good very students. well, both of them. Yeah, I just think yeah. that's great. <laughs> so, what year did you retire? <sighs> I think it was the, I, I retired in December at the end of the semester. And so it was either 98, very close to 99, or 99, very close to 2000. I cannot remember either. And you, then you went on to become a judge. She was traffic judge. Oh, yeah, traffic years. judge for a while. Really? Two yes. years. In Stillwater? Yes, huh. yes, the university. And I don't think they particularly like me as traffic judge because uh, students like we would go them. out. Uh, well, uh, we I'd have Earl drive me around, and we'd look at the different places. And if they said. Uh, one person says, I got this ticket for not being in the right parking place. And he said, you couldn't see the markings. They were covered with mud. You know, it had rained. So I went out and looked. It had covered all the markings, you know, and I'd say. But it would really get them because I forgave a lot of them. But I hung in really tight, too, with a bunch that, that didn't. But uh, we'd just go out and look. And the student's like, because you're being fair, otherwise you know a student got a ticket, he's guilty. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's just the way it was. And they try to appeal it, but very few of mine were appealed because, you know, I I had the goods on them, whatever yeah. it was they were wanting to appeal. <laughs> if they knew. I tell them, sure, yeah. you know, appeal. You can do it. There's, there's a board of people you can take your appeal to, but, you know, you were, uh, on the line. You were, you know, I went out and I saw what the situation was. And uh, it wasn't exactly as you described it. <laughs> so I have very few of them. And I don't think I ever had an appeal that was turned over. Finally, they just debanded, disbanded the appeals court. Yeah, because for once the kids were getting a fair shake, guilty or innocent. And you know, that, that was something that needed to be done. I hadn't thought of much about it. But I got a ticket or two over there. You got a ticket, you were guilty. I just paid it. What's the use? Whether you felt guilty or not, well, they went out in front of this old judge, she'd go out and look. <laughs> look <laughs> but he, but he, he's retired, you see, <laughs> and so he's yeah. driving and I'm looking and we're... She'd write it down and then go mm -hmm. in and her, you know, when you got the answer from her, you'd been in front of the court. Look, mm -hmm. I went out and saw it. You're guilty of sin, you know. <laughs> Or you're not guilty. Well, what was your position when you retired? What was your title? Uh, associate professor. I needed to write more articles. Yeah, that's one thing that if you... I don't think you ever wrote You sit down and you write the stuff up, you know, that's what gets you known in the professor 
and I mean in the the school um, people if you're if your researchers publish in the good articles it really makes your your university have a real good reputation too I mean it, it, it is important and that's part of the uh, extension you know is getting your results published uh, I kind of as you say thought of my extension as what you say and I didn't get enough things published they were publishable but uh, I was busy doing other things. Well, what are some things that have kept you busy in retirement? Um, well, let's see. Uh, oh, word and crossword puzzles, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and great walking great the dogs, great, great. and try and uh, the grandchildren. And uh, we now have two great grandchildren. This is the one of the few three, <laughs> three. <laughs> so four, all girls. <laughs> Normally we were raising the grandchildren. We had somebody in the house. Yeah, and, and uh, Michaela but was, while her dad was in, uh, yeah, in Michaela, house. when she was three years old, uh, his wife just asked him to leave and take, because she was just wasn't ready to settle down yet. So Michaela moved in with us, she and David, when he was about three, and it was, uh, the the um, and I remember reading in the divorce decree or something that he had a place to go to take her so that he wasn't like these, these single parents that are uh, well, don't have enough time with, with the child too so anyway uh, so she was with us, uh, with you know, had some spent yeah, some time with her mother, but yeah. mostly uh, until. We and she's how old now? Sixteen. Uh, Sixteen now, and now she is. Uh, uh, she's spending most of her time with her mother, and uh, she that was her decision. But she still like she drifted in here yesterday for some Which reason. Which me because I I actually have power of attorney. But you know, uh, before that, Amy was here for a while. We had Mary Jo. And, yeah. We, and there's always somebody. There. It's my theory that empty nest is a rumor. <laughs> I mean, now the kids are mostly gone, but we've got their animals. <laughs> they left well, we two cats, two dogs. Amy well, Lee will be here any minute. Yeah, she yeah. may be. This is third Well, what in your life has given you the greatest satisfaction? Hey. Uh, first, my marriage. Hey, that's okay. <laughs> well, the other things pass away. <laughs> and then, you know, I think through it all, I really thought I couldn't stand to be away from school because I really did think that I taught my classes better than anybody else could. And you know, I haven't had any urge to go back. And I think it's because the family. You know, we've had family around, it's here, and, and there's things that uh, sometimes I couldn't be a part of because I was teaching and um, so it has, uh, I, I love my professional life but I didn't have any trouble at all giving it up and it kind of surprised me but we have had so much in, and we were very lucky only one of our children, uh, David, John is, well David's in Afghanistan now but that doesn't count, John is up in uh, Indianapolis and that's a long way off and we don't get to see as much of John but our other children are close Amy uh, is in Tulsa she's the one that's furthest away right now and uh, up until recently you know White and Katie were here um, so now they have scattered but still it's uh, 
and not as I talk to other people uh, when they grow up the kids and usually they go off like in your family you're still your uh, your mother and her sister you're still close enough that you all are here can be a family and you get together pretty often um, and so many other times they the kids you know, move to Alaska they do something and uh, so it's been real nice having family and I haven't ever felt bored And we really don't, I kind of feel bad that we don't do more things, but yeah. that we've just been content. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, how important has OSU been to you? Uh, very important. In the first place, it's sometimes kind of hard to get a job where you went to school. And uh, they think of it as inbreeding. But on the other hand, they were impressed with me as a student. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I really appreciated this college and the university. Uh, I think it, what impressed me as an outsider is they were. In, at least in her college, in her group, they were loyal to their good students. You know, but two of them worked there for a while and were well received. I, I think that kind of rare. Yeah, I liked uh, I liked the uh, philosophy uh, about the university and about the college, about the department. And they put up with a lot from me too, you know. <laughs> like I wasn't publishing as much as I should, and I wasn't. Uh, but I was doing the things that I wanted to do, and so much of the outreach with the uh, people in the, in the state. Um, and I think my dean appreciated that. She'd go out and be talking to somebody and they'd be telling her about, oh, yes, we've been working with Dr. Nye on this, that, and the other, and she'd come in and say, could you kind of try to keep me posted as to what you're doing? <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of embarrassing sometimes when I go out. And I didn't do a very good job of keeping her posted on what I was doing, but it was... Um, they give you a lot of independence. But I like to work with the little people, I guess. But an extension, if your job is pure extension, you're doing a lot of that. But I just love teaching too. So this way I could I could do it both. And uh, teaching, as I said, the classes that I love, the ones that I liked best as an undergraduate were the ones that I got to teach. Have you had some family members graduate from OSU? Well, let's see. Yes. John, uh, Benita finished with that two year Benita degree. An degree. Amy yeah. has a degree in wildlife management. Yeah, None of them chose my field. Mm -hmm. uh, David went to school for a while, but not long. But John has got so. what, Benita three finished. degrees yeah. from? OSU. Jeremy finished over there. Jesse finished over there. Or I think he's going to finish the <laughs> fall. He's a casual student, but I believe he's going to make it. Yeah. And uh, Mike, of course, uh -huh. finished and worked for him for years. And uh, Still does. Mary Jo finished over there. Yes, and, and he's been teaching. Katie. Katie, Katie and, and Mary's oh, Katie been teaching in art. Katie finished Of course. And, uh, now Wyatt. Yeah, I can claim it. Dustin, you look going to be <laughs> Claim another one. one. <laughs> We're pretty much an OS. Sounds <laughs> like it. You have some <laughs> grandkids that aren't quite ready, but in the next yeah, Stephen 15 now, years. Boy, or, well, Stephen. There's some great grandkids. Amy's yeah. uh, son is uh, a senior next year yeah. at Broken Air. 
Yeah. He will be going, I think he's going to go to Tulsa for his first two years because it's free. Oh, wow. He wants his degree for issue. But then he's, he's uh, already <coughs> working, you know, with advisors so that hmm. whatever he does at the, over there at Tulsa will be transferred. Transfer. He's made awesome. good grades, so he will do it. That's great. We've tried to set up the account to help him, too. We hope to get all of our grandchildren through school. <laughs> Put the great grandchildren. That's going to be up to, <laughs> yeah. that's going to, be up to the next generation. Well, when history is written about you, yeah. what would you like for it to say? Mm -hmm. Um. Hmm. Is Amy I guess. I, uh, hmm. Well, <laughs> uh, I'd like for, and I think that all of my students really felt that I was fair and did a good job and if they needed um, something extra special they got it. Now about the rest of my life, I don't know. <laughs> uh, I'd like to do, uh, don't do as much as we did. I liked my involvement with uh, church work and particularly with international students from the university that we would teach English to. Um, I like serving on the uh, University Center Foundation at, at church because I think of my experience as being actually a teacher and such at the university. It, it helps me have a feeling for, for what the university students mm -hmm. uh, at church do need. Um, but I don't, I, I, you know, I've been uh, very unremarkable about most things. I didn't uh, win any peace prizes. I didn't, uh, but I think it's what, it what I did in my mind, I did well. Wonderful. <laughs> well, thank you very much for visiting with me today.